Great to see you. Good to see you. All right, folks. Thank you so much for tuning in. Really appreciate it. Uh, I'm going to be talking about how to sell your games company. Uh, it's a um, we, we have the world's most definitive tech uh, M&A education, a quorum group, but I've essentially distilled it to about a 20 minute presentation with uh, really a lot of focus on the games industry. So I apologize if this is gonna be a lot of data. Uh, one of the benefits of having this online is you can go back and view it again if you want, uh, or you can contact me directly if you like. So just a little bit about me. As Gordon mentioned, uh, my eighth grade friend, um, I am uh, uh, a, I'm the vice, vice president at Quorum Group, uh, which is an investment bank that's focused on sell side, uh, selling companies, uh, specifically software and IT companies. I have about a 20 plus year um, uh, career in high technology, specifically in the games industry, mostly. Uh, prior to joining Quorum, I was the founder and CEO of Sandlot Games Corporation. I started out in the industry actually in uh, 1994 working for a little company called Kesmai. And I noticed that actually John Taylor is, uh, is here uh, as well, who's my first boss back in, uh, back in the day when I worked on, on uh, uh, games such as Air Warrior, Multiplayer Player Battletech, uh, Legends of Kesmai, some, some, some well, well-renowned uh, uh, titles. And this is how I got my, my start in the games industry, I really started with a passion for it. Uh, uh, worked kind of my way through all the, all the ranks. I started as a programmer, became a sound designer, uh, managed a sound department, actually got into the business of games. Uh, started working for a company called Monolith uh, back in uh, 1996. Uh, and then finally, in 2002, started a company called Sandlight Games. We built a number of uh, uh, well-respected, well-renowned casual games. Um, the number one selling game of 2006, uh, Santa, uh, it was called Cake Mania back in the day. Finally sold it to Digital Chocolate in 2011. One of the things that happened and when I sold my company is I enjoyed it so much, um, you know, I enjoyed the thrill of it, uh, that, that I, was, I was really kind of captivated and trying to find out if there's really a platform by which this could, this could be both taught to, uh, to entrepreneurs and also um, you know, you, you, you feel very much alone in the process of doing this. There's, you know, it's, it's, it's like you're, you're working through a, 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 uh, a system which there, there is no manual. Uh, so one of the things that really amazed me about the Quorum Group when I started working with them is that, uh, you know, the, the, the process of M&A is really truly demystified. And that's one of the things that I'm going to try to do to you guys uh, in this talk today. So. There is, a, there is a value chain of opportunity associated with the games business. And there are multiple vectors associated with that opportunity. The main thing that you want to do is to derive the maximum value out of your company. And that is, of course, both the structure and the price of the, 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 uh, the deal that you're going to, uh, uh, to make uh, for selling the company. But you want to also think about how buyers perceive you. How do they view you uh, strategically? Of course, we'll talk a little bit about market trends, uh, both the macro market trends and specifically the market trends associated with uh, gaming. And uh, the bulk of the talk is going to be really about preparing for acquisition, uh, kind of really demystifying, opening up that black box associated, what does it really take to sell your company? So the number one uh, factor, uh, uh, you know, driver of value for uh, games companies is IP ownership. Uh, a lot of times, you know, we have a difference uh, of, uh, of uh, thinking about what is a uh, service company and what is a software company and kind of the traditional, uh, traditional overall uh, global uh, software space. And so if you're a service company, you don't own the IP. You're essentially servicing other companies that are building up their own, uh, their own IP. So as a result, you're constantly working through those contracts. Your value really is those relationships and possibly on your team, your manpower. But if you own your IP, uh, that IP itself has tremendous amount of value. And that is even more the case in uh, gaming where the IP itself uh, is, is a tremendous uh, value uh, creator and a creator of, uh, of uh, both audience uh, participation, audience uh, retention, and also revenue. So on, on the new technology side, you know, I would say mobile is now kind of in that uh, downward phase or at least flat where there's just a lot, a lot of uh, companies that are doing mobile games nowadays. New technologies out there 
uh, both wearable VR expertise. I can tell you that, uh, uh, that for sure, that most studios, most of the larger uh, game companies out there, uh, publishers and developers, are not really building up that expertise in-house. So they're looking for third parties, smaller studios, to acquire them to really gain that expertise, to gain that foothold into those types of markets. The business model has clearly shifted into free-to-play. So being a, an expert in free-to-play is going to generate a, an opportunity to derive premium value out of your company. Pay-to-own, which is kind of the traditional uh, uh, traditional uh, uh, buy the game or maybe in the, even the trial, a trial and then a purchase is really relegated to kind of the, the, the past way of doing things from a monetization perspective on the business. Profitability has become increasingly important in the games business. As larger game publishers, even public game publishers out there, have found it really difficult to maintain profitability on their uh, mobile or, or, or desktop uh, 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 free-to-play properties, the, 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 the issue has kind of precipitated into, you know, if you're able to actually run your game profitably as a service, you've got a high EBITDA that is immensely valuable in today's market. And, 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 and the, you know, on the converse to that, you know, spending to succeed is essentially when you have a situation where you have marketing spend outpacing your profitability, that becomes really a, a damper to your opportunity for, uh, to maximize your value in this, in this business. Repeatability. Buyers are looking for repeatable success. Uh, not just a company that has built a game, is generating profit from the game, uh, you know, but if you're able to do it over and over again, uh, and talking to one studio, they've got essentially a, a full list of bios of all their folks. And one of the things that's really great about that studio is that those bios really reflect well on their ability to build uh, hit after hit after hit. And even if you don't have a repeatable pattern of success for your game studio, if your team has a repeatable pattern of success, you're going to see an opportunity for a higher exit. So as far as not kind of on the total uh, gaming ecosystem M&A, this includes kind of the, the, the larger space uh, of ad tech as well uh, that's really associated with gaming. Uh, you're, you're starting, you, you see an increase in deal value, kind of tracks the overall uh, bull market associated with M&A, uh, as well as deal count is, has increased. However, if you look at gaming studio M&A, it is really, you know, we're projecting to about half of what it was from a deal value perspective of last year, but we're, we're seeing uh, kind of an increase in, in deal count as well associated with those, uh, with those acquisitions. So what that points to is, you know, buyers are becoming selective. They know there are, there, are, there are smaller acquisitions that they can make that can deliver a lot more value. On the casino real money gaming side, we're seeing a very similar trend as well, where you really are seeing half of the uh, deal value, but a steady increase in deal count. As far as gaming multi market multiples, this is where I go back and talk about EBITDA. EBITDA or profitability and multiples on that profitability are becoming increasingly important metrics associated with, with gaming. So we, we often talk about EV over S or, 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 or revenue multiples. They're kind of in that 2 to, to 3x uh, of uh, revenue. But EBITDA multiples uh, are really have increased from 8x to 12.5, 13x uh, as of July. So if you're running a profitable games company, I think you have an opportunity for a good, uh, good transaction. On the enterprise valuation of casino games, uh, you know, what I'm really looking, uh, uh, when, when I look at these slides, I'm actually seeing the, the breadth of transactions, both kind of the, the, the larger 1.4 1, 1. over $1 billion transactions all the way down to aqua higher level transactions on casino games, and also seeing uh, on kind of the traditional uh, video uh, game market uh, valuations. Uh, a lot of these acquisitions are now happening, uh, large acquisitions are happening with China, of course, notably there's, there's another one here from Liu and Perfect World are, are acquiring uh, Digital Extremes, a deal that we uh, worked with uh, Digital Extremes on at Quorum, as well as you see King acquiring uh, Z2 for 132 million as well, that's out of our Seattle area. So, you know, as an example of that Digital Extremes deal, uh, the, the, the target uh, company is out of uh, Canada, uh, free-to-play uh, PC uh, game company. Acquire was Liu Technologies and Perfect World. 
for the enterprise value of 120 million. So up and down the value chain from small acquisitions to large acquisitions, there are uh, M&A is still uh, important and possible for uh, companies that actually are kind of in that sweet spot of acquirers. So I will focus for the rest of the talk on eight stages of an optimal outcome. I've got about eight minutes, or not 10 minutes actually, to talk about what really is the, 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 the core of how you prepare and, and think about acquiring your company. So we're all uh, software CEOs, so we know how to run projects, we, we know project schedules, we know project timelines. Think about preparing your company for sale like you would prepare a, uh, a game, how you would build a game. You would, you, would, you would track for it, you would actually allocate resources to it, except in this case, it's not a product, it's actually your company that you're selling. So you need to allocate staff resources, conduct internal due diligence, which means take a look at your, you know, for example, take a look at your agreements. Make sure that you can assign your agreements uh, to an acquirer, right? Whether they're vendor agreements, whether they're customer agreements, uh, or whether they're simple things like your lease, right? Get your presentation materials ready. Think about it as an investment investor deck that you're putting together. Really something that positions your games, game company in the best light possible given some of the information that I've, that I've just shared with you. Research, you wanna prepare your buyers list. A lot of times we, we know who our closest, uh, who's in our ecosystem of buyers, especially in the gaming industry. It's a small, small industry, so we, we kinda know who's gonna be able to acquire us. But you know, one of the things that I've shown you in the previous slides is that there are a lot of buyers out of China that you don't know about. Uh, they would fall on your, what you would call your B list, folks that you're not aware of, but they may be aware of you, but they may not. But you need to think about who they are as well. Perform strategic analysis on each buyer. Why are they gonna buy you in the first place? It's not enough to think, okay, well, I, you know, they're there, uh, you know, I'm gonna go ahead and reach out to them. You have to think about why they would purchase you. What's their motivation to do that? Perform that strategic analysis, determine your proper contact, Maybe it's the folks that you met at GamesBeat. A lot of times it's the corp dev or the CEO that's not at GamesBeat, maybe at other uh, conferences, but a lot of times you, know, you end up uh, having conversation with folks that are not the decision makers in an M&A transaction. And you create that position statement for each buyer or buyer group that's really targets specifically what their point of pain is, what, they, what you believe is their areas of investment are going to be uh, in the future. You, uh, the contact is you're creating introductory correspondence. Uh, so what that usually is for, for us at Quorum is a, 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 a teaser that uh, anonymously explains your company, explains a little bit about your studio, what are the value propositions associated with your studio, and why a buyer would be interested in acquiring you. An executive summary is an expanded version of that, um, of that teaser letter that really talks about your company, has some financial data associated with it, uh, and at the point that you're having a conversation around the executive summary and financials, by then the NDA is signed, you're having deeper conversations, possibly management presentations. You know, one of the things that I talk about in the gaming industry, uh, you know, we, we're in the entertainment business. So, you know, you really have to get, uh, uh, you know, you, the, the, the conversation with a buyer and a seller is more like a marriage where it's really an act of love. They have to fall in love with your studio, they have to fall in love with your content, they have to fall in love with your games. And so log all the conversations back if you've got an internal CRM system like we do. Uh, make sure you're tracking that feedback and you actually refine your position statement based on that feedback. In the discovery, uh, discovery section, you really wanna make sure what happens there is when you're, when you're coordinating conference calls, site visits, et cetera, and meetings, you know, you're doing it in a very systematic fashion. You're, you've got a tech review process that's very systematic as well. You wanna make sure that you're talking kinda to the, to the top decision makers on their side, on the technical side, but you're also not really including everybody else that could potentially be a, um, you know, a, uh, a distraction for your team. You know, a lot of times we don't put together valuation reports. You know, we, 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 have a, you know, we have an understanding of what kind of the multiples are, standard multiples in the industry, and really the, the increase in those multiples are really the reflection of what is the, um, you know, what is the strategic imperative for a studio to, to have you. You may be a VR uh, game studio, 
And as a VR game studio, you may not have uh, any, or, 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 or you may have some, or maybe none, no revenues whatsoever. But you're of strategic importance to an acquirer. And that's something that can't be really captured by, by looking at these revenue multiples. And you also want to make sure that you uh, put together a, a due diligence on the buyer. Ask the buyer some questions. You've made some assumptions as to why they're going to buy you in the first place. But ask them, why do you want to buy me? What's, you know, can, you, can you point me in the direction of other companies that you've acquired? Can I talk to them? Um, and all of that is, is really incumbent upon you to figure out. Because at the end of the day, you're, going to be, uh, you're likely to be working for these folks. And if you can't get along with them, if you can't really figure out that you haven't integrated well with them, that may have a negative impact on you uh, in, in, uh, in the future. And so what we like to do is actually negotiate with top bidders. We be very, very specific with a letter of intent. A lot of, a lot of times that letter of intent, when you get a, the first version of the letter of intent, uh, the sum total of it is we agree to buy you for this amount of money and uh, sign here. Uh, and we, by the way, please sign this and there's a no shop for 30 days. No shop means you can't go back and, and, and essentially shop the deal. You have to deal with this particular buyer for the next 30 days or however long it takes for that uh, uh, letter of intent to expire. In order for you to get into that letter of intent, be as specific as possible, right? So, so we really don't have the time to kind of get into the, that level of specificity. I encourage you to go onto our website and the quorum group uh, dot com and also if if we are a lot of times you see us actually in uh, in the community we put on something called a selling up selling out conference which is essentially that uh, uh, the uh, equivalent of a uh, M and A boot camp uh, I really encourage you folks to to go to that and see because we're going to really quite a bit of detail on that uh, on what a letter of intent is supposed to have. But it's really important to have it be very, very detailed and very, very specific because at the end of the day, there's going to be a lot of work between the letter of intent and the closing. And this is the stage that we call the due diligence. You're verifying the financial statements. You might have outside opinions, advisors that are uh, included in. There's a, there's a legal financial due diligence associated with your company. Um, a lot of times the written explanation of business model is not necessary in our business. And then, you know, this is the, at the point where you're actually completing the definitive agreements and the attachments. Think about it this way. When you're signing on the lot dotted line to sell your company, that definitive agreement has to be the sum total of what you're selling, what you're presenting to the buyer. Anything that falls outside of that definitive agreement, you may be on the hook for and personally responsible for as the seller um, from a liability perspective. So you need to be very, very careful and you need to be very diligent. You need to be working with outside uh, advisors that have done this before, both on the legal side and also obviously on the investment banking side. Closing, if you've done it right, closing should be extremely anticlimactic. My closing when I sold my company was five o'clock at night. I'm signing a bunch of PDFs. I'm uh, sending them off to uh, our attorney. Um, and it was five o'clock, so everybody, I've told everybody that we've sold the company, everyone's celebrating at home, spending time with the loved ones. I look around, it's dark. Okay, well, I guess I sold my company, I'm gonna go and have a beer now. Uh, so if it goes anything outside of that, um, you, know, there's the, you know, you probably haven't done what you needed to do to make sure that you have a very smooth, successful transaction. Integration is the key to success, especially when you have something called an earnout included with your uh, M&A transaction. An earnout essentially is based on your future performance within the buyer's organization, you're going to get some of the consideration associated with, the, uh, with uh, selling your company. Now, those earnouts are contentious, but you start thinking about integration when you start looking at, uh, at how you would actually, uh, who you're going to go after uh, from, from an acquisition perspective. Uh, who, who you're looking to, 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 to purchase your company. So figure those synergies ahead of time. A lot of times, uh, those earnouts are useful for to close out that uh, valuation gap. So 30 to 80 global buyer candidates leads all the way down to one to three offers. It's, you, know, it's a, it's a, you have to have a large enough funnel to be able to get to the offers that you need. Sometimes it takes weeks. Here are very quick transactions. Sometimes it takes years. These guys went on hiatus, what we call hiatus. They learned a lot about their business from, their, uh, from going through this process, but they went on a hiatus to increase value. 
uh, and then they came back and they sold their company. In a global search, about 75% of buyers that are willing to sell uh, for more than what the first buyer was willing to, to give you. So, you know, again, lead, having a very competitive process leads to higher transaction values and better uh, outcome. There's some uh, deal killers out here that you guys can kind of get through there uh, as well. Uh, please feel free to contact me. I will give you guys more information as well as a, a, a PowerPoint uh, deck, a uh, copy of this uh, of the slide deck. Uh, appreciate the time and thanks again.